Uh, thank you very much for these very interesting presentations, and thank you for all the the presenters as well. To to as you said that you are not so sure how these presentations link uh, with each other, and I must say, me either. I, I, I'm me much less because <laughs> because I just I, I just uh, saw and read your pres heard and read your presentations the first time myself as well. So this is very much uh, trying to put something together um, here at this at this moment. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, these four presentations. They, 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 what's in common in, in them is that they differ in everything. They differ. There's one from Africa, one from Africa. Uh, there's South America, Asia, and then Middle East. Uh, also, time-wise, uh, it's it's uh, from the 70s to 2022, the latest data. So uh, there is a lot, and also conceptually, um, many things. So what I decided to do while I was t taking my notes was to have some questions. Uh, for for each of you, and we'll see if there's something then that that can be brought uh, brought together. Um, in the first uh, uh, presentation on civilian agency and resistance uh, on Myanmar, my question was um, on this civilian civilian monitoring uh, and these civilian monitoring missions is is. Um, uh, when civilians are monitoring other civilians, so my question here was that are these civilians outsiders or insiders? So it's civilian monitoring civilians, uh, but are they uh, from the same countries, from the same community? Do they already understand the dynamics when they go to the region? And you showed two different uh, regions and two different conflicts with two different uh, armed actors as, uh, or sub-states or how they're called in Myanmar. So, uh, and how does that play if it's outside, uh, outsider civilian or inside civilian uh, monitoring? And then um, my second question was that as ceasefires usually uh, are quite volatile contexts. So, um, because a ceasefire is supposed to lead at some point to a political agreement, and this is still only the military agreement. So, and it's not a permanent state. So, how does time play there? Can you have a civilian um, a civilian moni uh, monitoring mission monitoring a ceasefire for years uh, when the peace uh, doesn't come and there is no intention even for a political so solution? So, what is the time factor here? These were my two uh, main questions or reflections here from, from the first presentation. Um, and then on, 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 on the rebel governance and political engagement, um, it was very, uh, very interesting because you clearly um, brought uh, the, the, the case of these, um, this rebel uh, governance uh, to, you said, position, the, you measured their position relative to the state and you looked at the governance ideology. So you clearly make an argument that these are political actors, they're not grievance actors, they are uh, um, political actors. So my main question was that these uh, political actors, uh, is, was the argument that they create new political uh, agency or they transform earlier political agency. This was not uh, this was not very clear. Although I see that that this is one of this is this is the, perhaps the main argument. And then another question was that when I looked at the data, um, there was something interesting that 50% of the pedits think that nobody or 48% think that nobody ruled them. So is it possible that they lived 60 years or 40 years of, of, of Colombian conflict and were not that even concerned about who ruled them or why they thought that nobody ruled them? That um, is it because you, you do show, which is very interesting, that formal and informal political participation were not mutually exclusive in these cases. That it's not that you can either participate in politics through a party or something, or then demonstrate that it, 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 that you can you can do both. But still, then if people think that that there's 50 percent or almost a half saying that nobody ruled them, so um, so is there then perhaps part of the answer saying that people participated in politics 
in the context of the conflict they had had for 40 years. So that creates a, 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 like, a, like a particular, you wouldn't say democracy, but you would call it a particular political um, universe where people uh, participate politically and these actors change. So this was, this was perhaps that you say the actors create and transform political agencies, so there is clearly something going on, but that uh, how much it then actually changes. This is what I was, what, what these were the, the main uh, uh, questions. And, um, and and um, on on the the presentation on the on on the armed civilian protection in Mozambique civil war, this was quite interesting to me because the data when you say when where and how, and the civil war go, starts from the 70s and goes to the 90s, so it's a really long uh, long time to do the analysis and have this have this data. Uh, and yet, you, you, when you speak about the protection of civilians, so um, you say that the, it's temporary. It's a temporary element, and then it's a temporary element in a in a in a 40 years conflict. So how does this temporarity uh, work there? It was my one question. And then the second, also, you said there's an elite collaboration in the adoption of the militias, or the adoption of militia through an elite collaboration. So I was wondering, is this elite support here, is it local elites very much, or is it national elites, or is it both uh, that then has an impact on, the, on, on this protection of, of civilians? And then uh, a political participation in this case, I was wondering, because I was still writing a little bit my notes from the previous presentation. Was it, is there a possibility for formal participation there or informal participation? Or is this a civil war context where you have nothing or at least it would need to be researched very, very like ethnographically to, 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 to see it? Or can you make a claim that, that there, is, there is in this case, if it's, there's elite support for these militias? So, uh, does that leave space for formal or informal political uh, participation? Um, and then the questions on the uprisings in Lebanon and Iraq. Um, it's very interesting, 2019 when those uprisings started, uh, you, could, you would think there's now something going on, that this, was, this is some type of a post-Arab spring, uh, eight years, uh, seven, eight years past, now something is happening. And then COVID came and then uh, the attention was shifted elsewhere or, the, or you showed that the protest changed or maybe there was a stronger repression because of that, I don't know. But it's, it's, it's interesting that there is this peak just before, uh, just before uh, the pandemia. And, um, I, I thought it was it was like interesting. You call these broken democracies, and there's this definition, which I think is quite workable, like corruption and neoliberalism, uh, and all that. Um, and and I was wondering whether how much do you see these as not transitional regimes, but transitional states still coming from uh, either from civil war or from the Arab Spring or, or states transitioning to something uh, where, the, where, where the, the, the state structures and the power has perhaps drastically changed. So how this links to these, these uh, protests. And uh, then my second question was that it's, it's I think you show with these, um, with this, the negative coalition and the generating outrage and the elite defections, that something is changing. Uh, perhaps the space for civil society or the, this, the, the society to protest is changing, and regime uh, repression is changing as well. So how difficult it is to study this in a transitional case, because uh, you perhaps don't know who is controlling 
uh, and repressing, that it's not very clear, at least in the case of Iraq, it's very hard to say whether it's a, what's happening inside of the government and inside of the particular uh, uh, states in, in, in Iraq, that uh, who is powerful inside of the army and who is uh, powerful within the political elite. And I think in the case of Liban Lebanon, there's a little bit more written about that, at least in the very general um, international media, but especially in the case of Iraq, how do you study that, the, what, the conditions of these, uh, these revolutions when everything is changing in terms of the army and the political, um, the political power? This is what I could do, and, and I hope you can answer my questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for these uh, excellent comments uh, and this very careful engagement uh, with our presentations in just such a short amount of time. Um, so these are excellent questions. So for the first question was um, um, whether the civilians who monitor uh, to protect other civilians in Myanmar's conflict zones are insiders or outsiders to the conflict zones. Uh, so these civilians are insiders. Um, they are a part of the local populations. They are part of the uh, main population groups, so the Kachin and Kachin state uh, and the Karen and Karen state. Um, they have local knowledge, um, they have a lot of buy-in from local civil society organizations. Their perception also was um, that they were very much um, threatened uh, by the Myanmar army, but uh, not so much by the rebel group. So the Kachin, both the Kachin um, Independence Army and the Karen National Union um, are known for being relatively benign uh, to the civilian population. So the monitors were acting as local monitors, uh, protecting um, the local uh, population with uh, support from the local population, but also with some contestation. So there were parts in the civilian population um, who were very skeptical about the peace process um, and who thought that civilians monitoring ceasefires or monitoring protection monitoring were basically playing into the Myanmar government's strategy of playing out rebel groups against each other in ceasefire um, negotiations. And because of that skepticism towards the Myanmar army and the Myanmar government, um, in the local population, um, these monitors also had a difficult standing in their own population groups. Uh, the second question was, um, how does civilian monitoring play out over time uh, in ceasefire contexts um, if the peace process stalls? And again, that's an excellent question. There's also some research, not just on Myanmar, um, but also on uh, Sri Lanka and uh, on the Philippines um, on such civilian monitoring. And Sri Lanka is another case um, where there was a lot of uh, support for civilians supporting the ceasefire monitoring, but we know that um, uh, the Sri Lankan civil war um, uh, re-escalated basically uh, and we know who won that civil war. So that ceasefire monitoring also collapsed. But generally the research also shows that civilians become monitors in ceasefire context precisely because these are fragile um, arrangements, precisely because there's very limited buy-in um, from the government side uh, in support of a long-term uh, peace process. And civilian monitors cannot replace that kind of buy-in and political will from um, the side of the armed groups, uh, and especially when that political will um, is lacking on the government side. And so over time, if momentum stalls, civilian monitors, they are unarmed, they don't have political power, they cannot replace um, that level of political power and buy-in from government and rebel forces. Okay, so thanks. Um, my name's Abby, everyone. I'm earning my, my, my position up here by answering our questions, the very good questions raised by the discussant. Thank you for these. Um, so the first question that you had, which is a great one, is what, so what is new and what is transformed? Or what, what actually is going on when rebels govern? And one way, or the way that I can think of to answer that is that we, we think, at least in the paper, what we develop is that there are different channels through which rebel governance can influence individuals relationship with the state and with political engagement more broadly. One is by shifting preferences about how things should be done to come to a new political agreement or to challenge power or to get some other kind of outcome that people want. And that, so it, people's preferences may shift, their beliefs may shift about what is most effective. So if you've lived for a very long time where 
There are new institutions built around shared governance and we know also often sort of um, obligations by people in the community to collectively participate in public good provision, for example, and they see that working, then they may have new beliefs about what is the most effective way to participate in, in politics. And so then finally, there, there could also be real incentives, right, to participate or not in a certain way, including punishment. So we know that there's lots of evidence for, you know, if an armed group imposed, imposed a boycott on elections, like the FARC has done multiple times, people would not have access to formal participation because the, the FARC would say, no, you can't do that now. Um, so all of these three possible channels could lead to the outcomes that we are expecting, and we, we, ca we can't really um, identify that very clearly with the data that we have, but those are th sort of theoretical channels. Another way to think about this is that armed groups unevenly or more intensively govern in some places than in others. And this is related to some work by our colleague Ana Arjona, who's now, who's on the rebel governance panel <laughs> simultaneously, right, where in some cases um, they really do seem to, um, how do you say, out outsource governance to the existing communities and then they kind of oversee it, that's her category of aliocracy, or more directly govern. And what we are saying here is that in either case, they can do that in different ways and emphasize different ways to govern given this kind of level of intensity. We also cannot measure that with our survey data. So that's something to keep in mind. That's related also to your question about why do 48% say uh, we don't know, no, when we ask them, did the FARC rule here, did the paramilitaries rule here, did someone else rule here? So we don't know why people uh, would have said that. We do know that those responses are clustered in certain rural communities where it's plausible that there was a much more distant relationship with a particular armed group or anything like that, and in urban communities which may have been less exposed to such more obvious forms of, of rebel governance. This raises an uncomfortable <laughs> challenge with our results or the logic of what we are trying to show with our evidence, which is that maybe more politically attuned individuals also seem to notice better and be able to identify which group is ruling them in any given moment, right? And then what we are actually seeing is just that politically informed people are also more politically engaged. That's also something that we cannot really disentangle here, but it's something that we need to raise, I think. Um, and then how can we know how much changes under armed groups a rule? Yeah. We, it's really difficult and fascinating, that's why we are writing this paper, but uh, it is such a long war and we don't have good ways to really know what's going on in a particular community and for that I think qualitative methods would be much better suited for that, right? To really have an ethnographic understanding of how communities shifted over time um, under, under a different armed group rule. Would you like to no, correct anything? Okay. <laughs> Yes, th thank you so much for your questions. The, um, why was civilian protection so late and so short? Well, that's, it's kind of uh, due to the history of the war, how the war spread. It started in the middle and then kind of um, subsequently s spread to these central and northern uh, provinces. So it came into Zambezia and Nampula in the mid-1980s. And then um, and then, uh, then the war kind of increased in lethal uh, lethality and intensity. And this is what I describe as local military stalemates um, that gave then rise to these um, forms of uh, civilian protection. And um, I should probably say that I'm only studying one group. There were other initiatives um, that were that are not very well studied, and it's not really well known how how many there were, how sustained they were, how long they were active um, across different parts of of this area that I'm also um, studying, that, but they weren't so durable and they were much smaller. Um, and they were also uh, non-violent forms of uh, res resistance, I should say, uh, in the south and also in the same uh, area. So they, they, they're, there's more than I had time to um, talk about. Uh, elite col collaboration was uh, important at the local level. So at the national level, uh, for Limo, the government never wanted to acknowledge any official collaboration with kind of a traditional armed force because of kind of the socialist ideology 
Um, and so at the national level, there was some kind of tolerance of alliance with these groups, but it was never officially um, acknowledged or supported. And so, so the local elite collaboration was much more important. Um, and uh, finally, um, what kind of forms of informal or formal participation were existent during the war? Well, not, not much. People were on the run. Um, they were hiding. Uh, outside their villages, um, it was it was a very especially in, during that time um, they were displaced. Um, so that was there were not very um, many other ways to participate politically. Great, thanks. I'm going to be super quick because I would love to leave some time for Q and A. So I won't do all of your great comments justice, but I'll just answer two of them quickly. Um, why 2019? Great question. Um, so there were four big revolutions in the Middle East in 2019, um, well, 2018, 2019, 2020, sort of Sudan, Algeria, Iraq, and Lebanon. Not a lot of evidence of diffusion, unlike the Arab Spring. A um, little bit, maybe, but the, not a lot of evidence that activists were collaborating or actively sort of, sh so, you know, I don't know, maybe something in the water that year, so, you know, but, um, but it, it, it is an interesting coincidence, and of course people are calling it sort of an Arab Spring 2.0. Um, COVID, was important, but the, as you could see from the protest charts, the revolutions were already on the downswing before COVID really set in. The, the COVID really was the nail in the coffin, but they were already decelerating before COVID really kicked in. By January, February, they were already, the protests were declining. Um, and then in terms of conceptualizing, I mean, yes, yeah, so we're going with broken democracy. We've debated this a lot. Um, some of these are post-conflict societies, post-conflict regimes, not all of them. Um, if we think about the larger universe, um, so Central America, the Balkans, Middle East are kind of post-conflict, but then there's some Eastern European and Latin American cases that really are not they're not really post-conflict. I also don't love the term transitional because it sort of implies that they're heading somewhere. And um, a lot of these regimes, I mean, Lebanon has been, has had this dynamic basically since independence, right? Certainly, I mean, since the civil war, but that was, you know, 25 years ago, right? So, I mean, they're not transition, because they're not really transitioning to anything. They're actually quite stable in this kind of collusive governing dynamics. And I think a lot of the regimes could be described this way. So we don't love the term transitional because it sort of implies a, a teleology that, we, you know, I don't think is really, True. So anyway, we're still trying to figure out how to case these regimes and what, but we're going with broken democracy for now just because we think it encapsulates the kind of problems that these, 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 these uh, democratic regimes have. So. Thank you so much. Super interesting. I think we need to have at least two questions, otherwise it's not democratic. So uh, I saw this gentleman raising his hand like this already five minutes ago. So I think that the floor is now yours, you with classes. Yeah, that's you. Yeah. Ah, yes, Andrea Ruggeri, University of Oxford. And this is a question for Killian Ackley, because you, you actually, you trigger a lot of ideas and it, it's a fantastic project. So the first thing is just pedantic in the sense that you talk about revolution, uprising and protest. And so I was wondering whether, uh, you know, I, I know your work, I know Mark Basinger, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is coherence and, and analytical thinking there, but uh, to me, actually, we are, what you're talking are mostly extra institutional collective practices of incumbent removal. So basically you have these uh, uh, collective movements that they try to remove the incumbent. So th my comments question is that you talk about broken democracy, but it seems to me the mechanism is that there are broken democracy, but resilient polyarchies. So the crucial point is that they can give highly symbolic concession because being ha power being polyarchic, you can basically con give concession on sim symbolic, uh, and therefore they absorb this. Um, I, wa I wonder if uh, you can give us maybe a less, I don't know if it's a positive or negative story, but if actually the case it can be that after the focal point disappeared, because also you don't mention focal point, but it is that once you have the highly symbolic concession, the focal point disappear, and therefore there is the uh, end uh, of the collective action. But can be that small but highly organized group can hijack 
demobilization after the first focal point. And the second point is that you didn't tell us anything about when actually the incumbent decide to go uh, non-constitution or basically become even a more broken democracy. And now I think we had the gentleman in the back that was really number two asking for the floor. And then I think we have, uh, you know, like this other gentleman right there. Uh, and then we need to finalize this round. Thank you. Great for uh, these presentations. I learned a lot. Um, I just w would like to ask about the the in the case of Mo uh, Myanmar the uh, organizational dimension of this civilian agency of this monitoring if there is any and what is the the relationship of the of the of thus those organizations with authorities because um, yeah talking about civilian agency without any uh, kind of organization or uh, structure or whatever. So it seems a little um, rare. Um, are they related to trade unions, to human rights net networks? And what, I, what is the relationship with the authorities? And this question is for Avi. <laughs> um, where and how do you locate or conceptualize in your argument the permanent killing of social leaders and and the role that that play in these forms of governance and, and I, okay. I think we had already our okay. questions and then the gentleman right there thank you okay thank you to all uh Carlo Coast, university of bergen two questions or comments one to uh, michael and abby and the other one to um um, the presentation on Myanmar. So the first one to, to Michael and Abby. I was wondering whether you have some more um, aspects on your, on your uh, treatment or explanatory variable that you could exploit. So not just only whether they were under the rule or uh, under a certain ethnic um, armed group, but whether, for instance, there was some competition between armed groups, how long they were under uh, rule uh, among different groups and whether, for instance, competition between armed groups could give, one option would be uh, the civilians more bargaining power towards the relationship towards the armed groups or vice versa also remove bargaining power. So I, I don't know if there is more actually that you could exploit actually and to get um, a handle on the mechanisms. Um, to Jana uh, on Myanmar. I think it's so. I was uh, I found that very interesting, but I was wondering on several fronts where what the what the essence is actually of of what you were telling us. So uh, you're saying that civilian agency was strengthened actually through a kind of adaption of this external intervention. So I would really like to know a little bit more about what you mean with. Uh, that protection has been strengthened because I think we need to boil that down to how does it manifest on the ground, right? How can you make that claim based on two states um, that uh, the adoption of these uh, monitoring uh, technologies, if you will, um, contributed to the protection of civilians or strengthening of civilian agency. I think these, these terms need, uh, need really an empirical grounding and I would have loved to see a little bit more evidence on that. Um, similarly, I, have, I, I was wondering, okay, what do you mean actually with, uh, with this monitoring technology, right, and the networks and the institutions and wha what is behind all these terms? Is it that the people who were part of that program received, I don't know, a mobile phone, airtime for their mobile phones, contact numbers, and is it, could you not imagine to have, ob having observed the same impact for other people who haven't been part of that program. So is there, uh, like at least theoretically, what is the counterfactual that you're comparing or making that claim to that there has been this adoption and, and effect of this program? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we start with Killian, we go to Jana, and then we go to Abby and Mike and all the remaining then, uh, of course, will be 
directed to you in the middle <laughs> because there are, I think that, you know, like the, some of the questions were just so large that, you know, like uh, you can also contribute. Um, it's nice to see that there are competing universities from same countries in the, uh, you know, like uh, taking, taking the floor. So very interesting for a civil servant to see that. But yeah, uh, I think Killian, please go first. Thank you. Um. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Andrea. Great, great, great questions. I won't address all of them, but these are really uh, good food for thought on definitions. Yeah. So what is a revolution? Um, Thirty years of scholarship, and we still don't know. Um, so basically, we're going with the sort of political revolution definition. Um, so regime change through popular mobilization. So the question is, are these efforts at regime change? Right. That's and we don't normally. Th would think about regime change in democracies, right? Um, we're making the sort of provocative statement that actually the claims in these revolutionary movements do amount to claims or, or demands for regime change because they're calling for something fundamentally different, that these democracies are so broken and so problematic and the things that these these, these protesters want are so profoundly different that this ultimately does entail a call for regime change and therefore we ought to categorize them as revolutions just as we normally you know think about revolutions in autocratic contexts and so yes they are also extra institutional practices of incumbent removal but because the, the claims are so severe because they're demanding more than just the removal of the prime minister because they remain in the streets after the prime minister goes these are really these are really revolutionary movements and they should be thought of as such and theorized as such, right? And then we're thinking about the variation across. So that's sort of to answer your first question and we can maybe talk more about your other ones, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, just very briefly, um, the civilian monitors in Myanmar were recruited uh, through local civil society organizations. That means there were local people recruited, um, oftentimes people who were previously active as community leaders, pastors, religious leaders, and so on. So they had some previous um, experience. They were not from one particular organization and so on. But the very fact that they were local, lo recruited locally through CSOs meant that they were not neutral in any term. They weren't outsiders. And so there was a lot of pushback from the Myanmar government on the grounds that these civilian monitors were not neutral observers um, of what was going on. Um, uh, and that was a problem for these uh, monitors. Um, the second question in terms of um, empirical evidence, basically, uh, I, I can't give you the long story now. Um, the work that I presented is available online. Uh, it does come with a lot of limitations. Um, uh, it's based on interviews with civilian monitors and their own perceptions, and some interviews with civil society organizations. In an ideal world, we would have done a lot more interviews and maybe a survey with the local populations to get a more uh, broader view of how the local population sees these civilian monitors and what effect they had. We can't do that or we couldn't do that because the conflict zones in Myanmar are extremely restricted in terms of access, ethically simply not possible. So these are findings that are based on the perceptions of the monitors uh, and their narratives. Uh, and that's very clearly stated uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the published work. Um, thanks uh, for these questions, uh, especially Mauricio, it's really nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So uh, your, your question about how to integrate the killing of social leaders, I think is a, a really great one because it helps me think, or it, help, it helps us maybe interpret the finding that paramilitary rule is associated with informal, an increase in informal participation because it may be the case that precisely where paramilitaries governed in the past, they had already eliminated social leaders that they found to be too leftist and activist. And so in those places, it's now safe enough for people to participate in these informal ways without fearing retaliation. It could be an interpretation of what we are finding there. So thank you. I think to understand that empirically, we would need to do something where we are looking really geographically at the spread of the killing of social leaders. For those of you who don't know, it's hundreds of social leaders have been killed since the peace agreement was signed. So we also, I also don't like post, the post-conflict uh, term, but it's hard not to use it. Um, we, we do have additional measures in the survey, but maybe that's something we can talk about with you uh, it, at the coffee. I don't want to keep everyone yeah. too much longer. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you so much. Super interesting panel. I'm, I'm sure that all of you who are more cognizant of the matter also uh, got very much out of this, but I certainly enjoyed it a lot. I mean, like uh, a director general seldom gets to have such wisdom in 
one floor. I'm sorry to say there are some of my people sitting in the room, but it's no, I mean, like this elevated um, debate and argumentation is always a pleasure. So thank you all of you uh, for very well presented uh, papers and active conversation. And I'm really sorry about the fact that we were not able to have more questions. I don't think it reflects the state of democracy in Finland very well, but uh, there is always a coffee break, so thank you very much.